Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If you haven't heard by now, there is a comet gracing northern skies as we speak. I've been getting up at about 4.30 a.m. so I can catch Comet Neowise just before sunrise. But as time is going on, it's moving further away from the sun, and it's now getting visible in the evenings just after sunset at certain northern latitudes. So yeah, if you're living north of the equator, there's a pretty good chance you'll get to see this. Um, I was able to take photographs of it using nothing more than an iPhone with a long exposure app, but of course, I've got proper cameras and I've been taking great pictures. It, binoculars are great to help see it. Small telescopes are fine. You don't need big zooms on it because it's a comet and it's an extended object. So finding it is really easy right now. You just look just before sunrise and it should be obvious in the northeast. And if you look just after sunset, it should be in the northwest. As of right now, it's moving away from the sun towards the earth and that should move it further away from the sun so it should be seen uh, in, you know, in darker skies rather than close to twilight. That does mean as it moves away from the sun, the heating gets less, the activity gets less, so the comet will start to fade. But if it's coming towards the Earth, you will get, uh, it'll be easier to see because it's nearer the Earth. Moreover, as it's moving away from the sun, it should get easier to image just because it's no longer near the sun and you're no longer having to image close to the, uh, close to the horizon during twilight. So the comet's full name is C2020 F3 Neowise. Neowise refers to the spacecraft that discovered it. F3 indicates that it was the third comet found in the second half of March. So each month is split into two letters. January is A and B, February is B, uh, C and D, and March is uh, E and F. It was discovered on 27th of March. 2020 is obviously the year it was found, and C indicates that it's a non-periodic comet. That means it hasn't been seen at multiple apparitions. Although we do know that it is a periodic comet because we now know that its orbit is going to bring it back in about 6,800 years. So the comet was discovered on its way in towards perihelion and of course people thought it might be a big comet, we weren't sure. We've seen Comet Atlas and Swan both be predicted to be big comets and both fizzled out due to you know, the sun basically overheating them. But it reached perihelion at about 0.3 AU on July the 3rd. And soon after, people started really submitting some amazing images showing that it had brightened a lot. We have images from the space station of this comet, which is pretty amazing. Also, Parker Solar Probe had a unique viewpoint, and it had the hardware to be able to image the comet uh, on July 5th. While we can't directly measure the nucleus while it's inside its uh, massive cloud of dust that it's generating, it's probably about 5 kilometers in diameter. This is probably the best comet since uh, 2006, which was Comet McNaught, and that was also one of these comets that came very close to the sun and produced an amazing tail. Uh, it was also hard to observe because it was so close to the sun, but it was so bright that I actually have this amazing photo that I took where you could see the comet in daylight. I'm really proud of this image where I'm holding the comet filter away from the camera so that you can focus on the sun and see the comet relative to it. But I, it's really hard to see, but it's definitely there. Anyway, I want to take this opportunity to talk about Neowise. Now, Neowise is a mission operated out of JPL, but it's actually the reincarnation of a previous mission called WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. And that was a mission launched in 2009 on board a Delta II rocket from Vandenberg. And it, all it did was it point it would orbit in the sun synchronous orbit with the along the day night terminator line. And its camera would point directly away from the Earth. It had a 40 centimeter telescope. The telescope would have a field of view of about three quarters of a degree. And as it moved through its orbit, the area that it was pointing to would move around with its orbit. So there's a little mirror inside that telescope that would cancel out the motion or the rotation of the spacecraft and allow it to take a static static image for nine seconds, then it would reset the mirror and every sec, every 11 seconds it would take another image of the sky. So the camera or the sensor in there was a 1024 pixel square sensor that uh, would cover four wave bands, 3.3 micrometers, 4.7, 12 and 23 micrometers. These are all in the infrared. So as the spacecraft moves through its orbit, it's imaging an entire band of the sky through quarters of a degree wide. 
But because it's in an orbit around the Earth that is a sun-synchronous orbit, it's being twisted around by the oblateness of the Earth to rotate with the motion of the sun, or sorry, the Earth's motion relative to the sun. So as the Earth moves around the sun, this area of the sky that it's, the spacecraft is scanning is being twisted with it, and over six months, it will eventually cover the entire night sky in these four different infrared wave bands and create an entire map of the sky in infrared. Hence the name, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. Now, to make these sensors work, they had to cool them down to 4 Kelvin. And to do that, you have a liquid helium cooling loop. But that cooling loop was itself dumping its heat into a solid block of hydrogen. So the hydrogen would be at 20 Kelvin, and it was slowly, essentially, sublimating away over time. And that meant that the mission had a limited lifespan. It was designed to work for about 10 months. It took about one month to get the sensors up and calibrated. They got a complete survey for six months and then another partial survey for the final three months. And then the coolant was exhausted and the cameras warmed up and were no longer able to operate. But during those six months, it found a whole lot of really cool stuff. It found a lot of brown dwarfs, and it actually found brown dwarfs which were closer than Wolf 359. So Wolf 359, before WISE, was considered to be the third closest star system. Now it's the fifth closest star system since Lumen 16 was discovered, and that's a binary system that's uh, closer. And there's also WISE 08550714, and that's now the fourth closest system. It's a brown dwarf also. It also discovered thousands of near-Earth asteroids. And back in 2010, my first big YouTube video was this uh, visualization of the discovery patterns of asteroids from, you know, 1970s up to 2010 at that time. And most of that video shows the asteroids being discovered on the opposite side of Earth, right? Because telescopes look away from the sun. But right in the last seconds, you can see there is a pattern that goes you know, tangential to the Earth's orbit. And a lot of people are like, what the heck is that? Well, that was, of course, the scanning pattern of the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. Asteroids are typically black or dark grey, so they don't reflect much visual light, but their surface heats up and they re-emit it in the infrared, so infrared telescopes have a much easier time finding asteroids, which is why WISE was so successful in finding asteroids. But of course, WISE ran out of coolant in 2010, its instruments warmed up, and it was no longer able to perform its original mission. Its instruments weren't sensitive enough. But people that worked on the project, they knew that they could keep the instruments cooled to a useful enough level that they could still discover asteroids. And they successfully campaigned for the mission to be restarted in the name of NEO-WISE. And NEO is obviously a play on near-Earth object, but also NEO as in new. So at that point, they could point the telescope away from the Earth, and because it's pointing at deep space and it has a sun shield, it will cool naturally to about 70 Kelvin. Obviously a lot warmer than 4 Kelvin, but still cold enough that some of the infrared bands are returning enough useful data that they can pick out hundreds of asteroids. And so NEOWISE continues returning data and it's able to find asteroids that no other surveys are able to because it's looking in different parts of the sky and it's looking in different wavelengths. So there's always going to be a subclass of objects which it's able to discover. So I think NEOWISE is a great little cost-effective mission because all it needs is support from the ground to download and process the data. The spacecraft has no consumables, it doesn't really have a lifespan related to running out of propellant because its attitude control uses magnetorkers and reaction wheels. But, uh, you know, obviously over time its orbit will slowly decay and the sun synchronization will probably slip out of sync and eventually it won't be able to point, you know, perpendicular to the Earth. But that will probably happen long after its successor launches the Near-Earth Object Surveillance Mission, which was previously known as NEOCAM. This is a very similar spacecraft, it, but it instead is going to be launched to the L1 point between Earth and the Sun. It's targeted for launch in 2025. It will be a bigger telescope with more capabilities and will probably even further explode the number of asteroids that we are able to find and track. 
And that is, of course, the fundamental first step that needs to be taken to uh, deal with any potential asteroid hazard. You have to find all the objects, you have to identify the specific threats, and then you can start planning on how to mitigate those threats. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.